prepared. First of all, we need to be able to see spiritually thirsty people. Amen. I wonder today, as you go shopping, I don't know where you go, to the mall or Walmart or Target, wherever, do you look around and see spiritually thirsty people? Yeah. On your job, when you sit down with your clients and you meet with your co-workers, do you see spiritually thirsty people? If you're here today and you're a student uh, in the school that you're in, do you see spiritually thirsty people? Uh, did, you, did you think it all this week as you went through out your week, did you ever think, man, that person that I'm talking to, they really, really need the Lord. They really need Jesus Christ. Is it possible, I wonder, that we go through our life and we miss the harvest that's right there in front of us. We're like kind of like Charlie Brown. We, we see a ducky and a horsey, but we don't see a spiritually thirsty person. Come on. We've got to be able to lift our eyes and see the harvest. And that's what Jesus did. Jesus saw a spiritually thirsty woman. So let's just jump into the story here. John chapter 4. It says this. He came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there, and Jesus therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour, and a woman of Samaria came to draw water. Now the disciples were nowhere to be found. They had apparently went into town to water burger, okay, to get grab themselves a burger. And Jesus was sitting there. By the way, that was humor. All right, there was no water burger back then. But he was weary from his journey. He's sitting by this well. And this woman comes to the well to get water. And what we don't understand today about getting water is that nobody generally came at high noon, the sixth hour, to go get water. Who's carrying water Water is heavy. If you've ever been camping, if you're a royal ranger, you know about carrying water. Uh, I mean, it is heavy, all right? And so what the custom was is people would get up in the early morning while it's cool to carry their water back. But this woman, you see, she wasn't welcome at the well while all the other ladies were there. She was kind of an outcast because of the way that she lived her life. And so there she was getting water late in the day. And Jesus looks over and he sees her and he immediately knows. And it wasn't just because of the time of day. It was by supernatural spiritual revelation. I mean, come on, he's all gone. He knew exactly who she was. And he realizes that she is an immoral woman and he knows that there's an ache in her heart and in her soul. And he knows that this woman is coming at the sixth hour of the day because she's not welcome at other time and he sees everything about her and of course what we know is that Jesus is the master soul winner right and so he simply asked this lady for a cup uh, for a cup of water for a drink from the well and uh, when he did that Jesus was breaking every cultural norm that there was in those days men just didn't talk to women like that okay but Jesus broke that he was speaking to a Samaritan Jews didn't talk to Samaritans he was speaking to a woman most generally a man would not speak to a woman like that but Jesus broke that because he loved this lady and, and so what happens is he says may I have a drink of water and immediately the woman recognizes him as being Jew Jewish, and uh, she's asking, well, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask of me something, uh, you know, because I'm a Samaritan, and you people generally don't speak to us or deal with us. And you see, Jesus immediately went to her knees. How many of you know that he's interested in being on knees? Amen. Yeah. And he saw that she was spiritually thirsty. He knew that she needed the drink of something that would satisfy her thirst. She was looking for love. She was looking for forgiveness. For forgiveness. She was looking for something that would satisfy the deepest longing in her soul. And Jesus knew that in her heart there was a place that only a relationship with God could fill. That's right. And so he said these words. He took it out of the realm of the natural and put it into the realm of the spiritual. And he said, if you knew the gift of God and who's asking you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Yeah. Okay, but now this lady, she's not getting it, okay? She, she's not grasping what he's saying. And she's like, well, you don't even have a bucket. What are you, how, who are you? Are you 
greater than Jacob, you know, who gave us this well. But Jesus just presses in. And I love these words in John chapter 4, verse 13. He said to her, whoever drinks of this water is going to thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. I wonder, is there anybody in the house who's drank of the living water of Jesus? Amen? It is the most satisfying thing in the world to know that your heart and your soul and your life are right with God. That Jesus dwells on the inside. Come on. Aren't you glad for Jesus today? And Jesus went on to say, but the water that I shall give him will be become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. And this woman says, well, yeah, please give me this water so that I'll never get thirsty again and not have to come here to draw. And I don't think she was getting it really at all. Maybe just a little bit her heart was starting to open up. But you see, there was something that she had to look at. There was an issue that she had to confront in her life. There was sin that had separated her from God. Can I just go ahead and preach for a moment today? Yeah. My sermon, I want to do it anyway. Y'all know that, right? All right. There is within the modern church, uh, especially in the United States of America, there is a fear to actually talk about sin in the same way that Jesus did. We are afraid that if we mention sin, that it, would, it might offend somebody. I'll have you know that there is an offense to the cross of Jesus Christ. Wow. Jesus went to the cross not to die for, for your negative emotions or your bad feelings. He died for your sin. Come on. And I'm so grateful that he did because it was my sin that was separating me from God. All right. And so if Jesus would have uh, been one of the many modern pastors of lukewarm churches today, he, he would have pretty much said to this woman, it's okay, everything, you're all right. Everything's okay the way it is. You don't have to worry about changing anything the way that you're living. It's okay. Here, have a drink. But how many of you know that the first thing God has to deal with us about are the sin issues in our life? Come on, can I have a hand to praise today if you felt that from the Lord? You see, he understood something. He saw that sin was separated men from God. And you can't drink the living water if you're looking to everything else to satisfy and to fill up your soul. Am I right? And so Jesus says to her this simple question. Where's your husband? She replies, I don't have any husband. And he said, you know what? You are exactly right. You don't have any husband. You have five husbands. And the man you're now living with is not your husband. And we have to ask ourselves, why would Jesus bring that up? And here's the truth. Jesus did not bring that up because he was condemning her. He wasn't trying to rub her face in it. Come on, somebody. Listen, John 3, 17 says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Jesus didn't bring it up to tell her how bad of a life she lived. Jesus brought it up because he knew and she knew that the lifestyle that she was living was not satisfying her deepest need. She hadn't filled the salt void in her soul. What Jesus saw was a thirsty woman. I'm just here today to tell you that the only thing that can satisfy the heart of mankind is Jesus Christ. Men and women look all over this world. They search for this and they go for that and they do this and they do that. But let me tell you something. The only real peace that I've ever found has been in Jesus. The only real hope that I have and that it's not in the U.S. government. It is in the King of Kings. And the Lord of Lords. Come on, give me give him a big hand. Only Jesus can satisfy this man. And what is was true with the woman in that day is true with many in the day and hour that we live. Our culture offers so many things that supposedly satisfy the heart and make life worthwhile. And the enemy puts it all in, in such a wrapper that he makes it look cool and he, he makes it look beautiful and it's with lights and it's with flavor and pizzazz. But I'm just telling you that the devil is a liar. Hello? The devil has nothing that you and I need. All we need is the Lord. And so, and so he says to our world, he says, oh, I know you're stressed out. So here, uh, have a little uh, 
talk on some marijuana. That'll make you calm down. That'll make you feel good. And I just want to say, you know something? Believers in Jesus need to find their calm in the Lord. We need to find our peace in Him. Come on. He tells our world, especially our young people, that the real life is found out there in the party lifestyle. Drink to get drunk, have a one night stand, do whatever you can do to just have some fun, go have a good time. And he points that the way and says, this is the fun way. But I'm here today to tell you that that does not bring life. All it brings is a headache in the morning and a feeling of being used. Come on, somebody. I'm trying to preach here today. He'll do everything he can to try to destroy. And Satan isn't happy with just a little marital rift. He wants to tear marriages apart. He wants to get people addicted to meth and, and cocaine and pornography and all kinds of things. And people try to fill themselves up with all of that. Let me tell you something. It does not satisfy. All it creates is a brokenness and a heart in the spirit. That's right. You say, well, Pastor, why are you preaching along those lines? Because here's the thing. We live in a world that's filled with people that are productive. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. When you walk through Walmart, the person in front of you, behind you, your clients, they're trying to fill themselves. If they don't know Christ, many of them are trying to fill themselves with those things. And so when we see people like that, here's the question. What is it that we see? So let me put it in a different way because I want to see it through the eyes of Jesus. Who wants to see it through the eyes of Jesus? What is it that Jesus sees when he sees someone that's bound, when he sees someone that's addicted, when he sees someone that's caught up like that out here in the world? I'll tell you what he sees. He sees their thirst. He sees that they're looking for something and he knows that he's the thing that will satisfy. You see, Jesus saw this woman as the harvest. And if you read the passage, the rest of the passage, it's fascinating because this woman was the one who went to her entire community and she began to tell everybody, I met a man who told me everything that I ever did. And, and you know, he said he was the Messiah. Could this be the Christ? Oh, hallelujah. She went and told him and she brought all the people to him. And, and, and actually, one of the greatest revelations of who Jesus was, was given to this woman who was broken and who was bound and, and who couldn't even go get her water in the morning hours with the other ladies of the city. I, the greatest revelation of Jesus, because they asked her a lot of jargon and talking about who worships here and who worships there. Finally, she said to Jesus, she said, when the Messiah gets here, I will ask him, he'll tell us what we need to know. And Jesus, in a very profound way said these words. He said in John 4 26, I who speak to you am he. He said I am the Messiah. I am the Savior. I'm the one that came. Come on somebody. Can we give him a big hand to them? You see Jesus when other people would say they're worth it. They have value. They're worth it. And so when you see someone that's bound up don't focus on their sin. Yes, they've got to. They've got to deal with that aspect of their life in order to come to Christ. But let me tell you, focus on their thirst. Amen. Tell them about me, says the Lord. Tell them that my offer of living water still stands. Tell them that real love and real peace comes from knowing me. Tell them that I didn't come to condemn them. Tell them that I came to set them free. Hello, who the sun sets free is free indeed. Tell them that Jesus wants to reveal Feel himself to them the way he did this woman. Tell him that his name is love, that he is the Messiah. Come on, somebody. Can we give a big hand for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? And I just want to say today, if there's somebody here that's bound, if there's somebody that the enemy's trying to put his shackles around, I just want to declare to you that Jesus sees your thirst. He sees what you need and he'll give you a satisfying portion. All you've got to do is come to him and confess and trust and believe come on whosoever will may come and drink of the water of life amen. Amen. amen that's powerful stuff actually to be ready for the harvest and I want to pray that God will give us those